ladies, my name is Abby Howe, president of the Diamond Bar Women's Club. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the members of the Diamond Bar Women's Club who will be speaking today. Nancy Lyons, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, City of Diamond Bar. Patsy Wilson, CFWC, California Federated Women's Club Area B Vice President. Rosette Clippinger, San Gabriel Valley District, SGVD President. Layla Abu Talib, Trustee Board Member, Walnut Valley Unified School District. Fred Jennifer Malky, Diamond Bar City Council Member. I stand before you, a proud woman, in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the women's suffrages. The 19th Amendment recognizes the significance of the women's suffrages. More than 26 million women were granted self-empowerment for themselves and their families and their communities along with the right to vote. The vote is a powerful tool of offense and defense. Understanding what it means to have a vote and just how your vote can work for you as a woman making a difference. We as women have come to understand the privilege of our vote and the common good of moving forward and making a difference. Thank you. I'm Nancy Lyons, Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Diamond Bar. Ida B. Wells Barnett is a name well known from the women's suffrage movement. Ms. Barnett had the cards stacked against her from birth as she was born a slave. Furthermore, after her parents died of yellow fever, she became guardian and head of household to her five younger siblings at the age of 16. In spite of this adversity, she was fortunate because she was born to parents who valued education, and so she pursued hers. Ms. Wells Barnett accomplished much in her life. She sued a railway for unfair treatment. She investigated the practice of lynching and of white mob violence. Ms. Wells Barnett was a founder of the National Association of the Colored Women's Club, which was created to address issues dealing with civil rights and women's suffrage. In 1913, Wells Barnett traveled to the first suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. On the day of the parade, Wells, Bar Wells Barnett and 60 other black women arrived to march with the Illinois delegation, but the black women su suffragettes were told to march and back. Ida Wells Barnett refused, saying, I'd go with you or not at all. She left the scene convincing the crowd that she was complying with the order and that she would not march. But just before the parade started, she returned and marched alongside the two women from the Illinois delegation, supported by white co-suffragettes. The event received massive newspaper coverage. This included a photo on the front page of a Chicago newspaper of herself and some white co-suffragettes. And as Wells Barnett spoke on this event afterwards, she shed light on the reality for the African-American participation in politics. Thank you, Madam President. I'm speaking as Patsy Wilson, African-American, Diamond Bar Women's Club member, CFWC Area B Vice President. Reading from the GFWC News and Notes 2019. GFWC, General Federation of Women's Club, was founded in 1890 and operated as a collection of women's literary clubs and professional organizations. These clubs included supporters and leaders of the suffrage movement. At the GFWC convention in 1912, Mrs. Charles Edison of California proposed a resolution in support of women's suffrage. The women were not ready. In the 1913 club women marched in the big parade in Washington, D.C. At the 1914 Chicago Convention, the resolution to endorse was again raised. The First World War was looming. Miss Carrie Chadman Catt spoke of the club's evolution of roles within society. Their duties as wives, mothers, and caretakers could include the right to vote. She said, 
Voting is an urgent matter of patriotic duty. This meant club women had altered their understanding of political participation. On the morning of June 13, 1914, the General Federation of Women's Clubs passed the resolution endorsing political equality of men and women and the right of women to vote. It took another seven years for the 19th Amendment to be adopted on August 26, 1920. Black women worked in their own clubs and sometimes with white suffrage organizations. In the 20th century, many more black women joined the mainstream clubs. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in March 1965, Selma, Alabama said, a man dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. A man dies when he refuses to take a stand for that which is true. We are going to stand up amid anything they can match up, letting the world know we are determined to be free. It was not until August 6, 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was passed that African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, or Native Americans, women were fully enfranchised. The General Federation of Women's Clubs was there throughout the movement as well as today. Thank you. Rosette Clippinger, San Gabriel Valley District President. Mary Ahrens was an English-born American teacher, lawyer, and social reformer. Ahrens distinguished herself early by graduating from law school with honors. She used her legal background to advocate for women's suffrage and pursued this goal through lectures, civic engagements, and lawsuits. Before working on a national level, she worked vigorously to open school elections so that women could vote in them. Mrs. Ahrens determined that voting in a school election would be a strategic step towards full suffrage. Mary Ahrens faced many obstacles and had to go to court many times to promote women's rights. In addition to her court battles, she also wrote newspaper columns and paper explaining why women needed to vote. She toured the country with a lecture series entitled Women's Disability Before the Law, explaining that under the law, a husband had the lawful authority to sell any of his wife's possessions, remove children from her care, or restrain her movement to the home. Mrs. Ahrens concluded for her audiences that only legislation giving women the right to vote would provide legal protections to women. Layla Abu Talib, Vice President of the Walnut Valley Unified Board of Trustees. There are many well-known leaders in the women's suffrage uh, movement, such as Susan B. Anthony, Sojourney Truth, and Mary Church Terrell. However, women's suffrage was supported, often actively, by large segments of immigrants, the working class, as well as a very diverse population of women. Sarah Raymond, a free African-American who in 1853 was forcibly ejected from her seat at the opera in Boston. She was an abolitionist and was used to fighting for citizenship rights. When she was ejected, she sued and was awarded $500. Clara Elizabeth Chan Lee was the first Chinese American woman to register to vote in the United States. She registered to vote on November 8, 1911 in California following the passage of the Proposition 4 in California, nine years before the passage of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Zitkala Sa and Suzette Lafleche Tibbles, both remarkable Native American woman leaders, 
Their activism for voting rights ultimately helped to achieve Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, which granted citizenship to all Native Americans born in the United States. But their legacy stretched well beyond 1924. In fact, some states excluded Native Americans from voting rights through the early 1960s and even today. Maud Nathan, a daughter of a prominent New York Sephardic family, Maud was a social worker, labor activist, and leader in progressive era reforms. Rose Scheiderman, another Jewish suffrage leader, had a very different life experience, one more like most of the American Jews. Her family came to the United States from Poland in 1890 and settled on the Lower East Side. Rose went to work at 13, beginning with organizing women in the factories where she worked and she became one of the founders of the Women's Trade Union League. The 19th Amendment ratified in 1920 did not resolve the issue of suffrage for very many women of color and immigrant women who continued to battle for their voting rights for decades. I'm Jen Fred Malky, Diamond Bar City Council member, and I'm honored to be in a long line of women who serve their community and their country through public office. Argonia, Kansas made international and national news in 1887 by electing Suzanne Salter as the first female mayor, mayor in America. The first female mayor in a major U.S. city happened in 1915 in L.A. when L.A. City Councilwoman Estelle Lawton became mayor for 36 hours. It was 11 years later when Bertha Ethel Knight Landis was elected as Seattle mayor in 1926 when finally a woman served a full term. Nellie Ross was the first female governor. She served in Wyoming in 1925 after her husband passed. She went on to be the director of the U.S. Mint from 1933 to 1953 and to this day is still the only woman to have held that office in Wyoming. For many women, a typical route into public office had to do with the being a widow. One exception to that is our first congresswoman, Jeanette Rankin. She was a Republican from Montana and was elected to serve one term in 1917, three years before women won the right to vote. She was elected again in 1941. There are many firsts that come with women in public office. Sandra Day O'Connor was the first Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States in 1981. Lee Ward Sears was the first black female Chief Justice in the United States. When she was appointed in 1992, she was the first woman and the youngest to ever be appointed into the Georgia Supreme Court. Carol Mosley Braun served as a U.S. Senator in 1992, and she's the first black woman to earn that distinction. Nancy Pelosi became the first Speaker of the House in 2007. Shirley Chisholm was a woman of first. In 1968, she became the first black woman elected to Congress. In 1972, she became the first black candidate for a major U.S. political party to, be not, to seek nomination for president. She's the first woman to run as a Democratic Party presidential nominee, and she's the first woman to ever speak at a presidential debate. It was 12 years later, in 1984, when Geraldine Ferraro ran for vice president, and 32 additional years later, in 2016, when we saw Hillary Clinton run for the president of the United States. According to the Center for American Women and Politics, Rutgers 2019, at the local, state, federal levels, less than 30% of political offices are held by women. There are many firsts to come for women in public office. Staying in the know, the United States representatives in the 116th Congress from 1917 to 1919. There was only one woman. 2020, we currently have 127 women. There are nine women serving as United States governors. The motivation was always hope that all women aimed higher and would serve the common good of her fellowship for one another. I now introduce to you the Diamond Bar Women Club. We have come a long, long way, ladies.
good. Okay. I think it's 